would in some way or other survive his own death. Well, the fact is that those who do believe in such things often encourage those who don't to make some sort of effort. It's a question, they say, of making a leap of faith. Well, the problem is that it's quite hard to imagine the sort of exercises that one would have to undertake in order to make such a leap, if indeed it was a leap. The best one can do is to visualise the sort of experiences, misfortunes, say, or even revelations, which might bring about a change of mind. But that's hardly a leap, and some people might simply regard it as a lapse. Now, admittedly, there are things that I believe in without being directly acquainted with them. For example, I've never actually seen a coelacanth with my own eyes, but I believe in them. Also, I believe that the Earth goes round the Sun, although it certainly doesn't look as if it does. I take these things on trust, for the simple reason that I recognise the authority of the people who say that they do. But then, on the other hand, you get a whole range of dubious entities, such as ghosts, witches, spirits and immortal souls, which I don't believe in at all. But the people who do believe in them don't necessarily do so on the basis of trust or authority. The psychological origins of such beliefs can be traced back to certain predispositions that we all share simply as human beings. The anthropologist Pascal Boyer has written at considerable length about the origins of the religious impulse in human beings. I think there are major themes that you'll find in most religions in the world, but those things are not the things we're familiar with. So um, a concern for who created the world, for example, is not one of them. Uh, a concern for mortality, uh, what's happening to me after death, is not one of them in a surprising way. Um, but the presence of unseen agents in the environment is one thing that you'll find everywhere. You'll find that there is some notion that there are spirits, ghosts, ancestors, um, agents of that kind that are sort of what I call counterintuitive because they're not like you and me or animals. They, are not, they don't have a physical body, but they have all the characteristics of agents like a mind, intentions, and so on. According to Pascal Boyer, this notion of unseen agents is not quite as counterintuitive as it might seem. It may actually be hardwired into our brains. In a primitive community, the accidents and misfortunes that inevitably happen make more sense if it's assumed that somebody or something actually intended them to happen. And strange coincidences, which are often genuinely hard to explain, make more sense if it's assumed that there is some hidden intention behind them. And those assumptions are often still made today. It may seem strange to suggest that we are hardwired to suspect that we are threatened by potentially malign as opposed to merely harmful forces. But there may be good selective advantage to this tendency in a world in which you're surrounded by predators. Although there's always the possibility of making embarrassing mistakes and over-attributing agency, seeing intention where there's none at all, it's worth making the occasionally embarrassing false positive when the alternative is the catastrophic false negative, in other words, when you land up being lunch. And it's only one short step from avoiding genuine threats to believing that other misfortunes may also be the result of malign intentional forces, that they may be the result of hidden, even invisible intentions directed against you. Now, what is it that makes that religious as opposed to what one might call, or what some people might call pejoratively, superstitious? Well, it's your choice of terms, mm. and I think it's just a human phenomenon that corresponds to what we generally call religion. I mean, what 
we tend to call religion is more this sort of institutional framework that uses those beliefs or that uh, fosters those beliefs. Uh, but really those beliefs are there, institutional or not, and they're there in very simple societies where you don't have a church. Uh, but that's just one of the features. Another one you'll find is um, a propensity to organize rituals, uh, to get together and do a whole set of things that are directed at those unseen agents in an organized way with a script that has to be rigidly followed. So if rituals based upon beliefs in spirits and witches represent the origins of religion, can we find the origins of atheism in these primitive communities? In these preliterate communities, would there be anything which corresponded to in what in literate communities would be the village atheist? Is there a village skeptic? No, I don't think there would be a village skeptic. What there is, there are characters of that kind who would have become the village skeptic or the atheist in modern context. But in that kind of context, that's not really a role that you could choose. So why not? Uh, well, because the kind of person who would say that witches do not exist, or that anti-witchcraft rituals are a joke, would be suspected of being a witch, would be who but a witch would go around saying there's no such thing as witchcraft. So that even in very simple pre-literate communities with relatively simple social mm -hmm. structures, uh, there is a, a close relationship between uh, village authority mm -hmm. and village belief. Well, very much so. I mean, you know, most of those places are places where you do ancestor cult, and ancestor cults are cults about dead old men, organized by living old men who have authority over everyone else. So one of the problems we have in telling the story of disbelief is that even in the most elementary social arrangements, religious belief became almost inevitably associated with authority and power, and as those social arrangements became more complex, with patriotism. Thousands of years later, nowhere is this association more obvious in the Western world today than it is in the United States of America. And few commentators have observed the phenomenon with more skepticism than the American playwright Arthur Miller. Certainly the, uh, the religious uh, overlay of patriotism has come into fashion. It's always there, of course, in this country. We, more people go to church here than, I think, anywhere. But uh, it's gotten heavier now. Do you think well, that's, is that since 9-11, or do you think... It was always here, but it's gotten thicker. It's gotten heavier, because it's such an easy way to, to cuddle up to the, what they think the majority is about. I mean, they've convinced a lot of people to forget that this country was founded by people who were really escaping the domination of a governmental religion and uh, who breathed freely here with great with gratitude that they didn't have to obey a church. And one also gets the impression that that the enterprise in Iraq had a sort of faith-based Oh, yeah. Patriotism. It wasn't just patriotic, right. it was they, Christian uh, patriotic. Of course, in wartime, I suppose we did that in the Second World War to a degree, but it was never laid on with a trowel this way. Uh, this is now being used as a means of persuasion. Uh, it's patent, it's obvious. Uh, they call upon God to initiate a program, whatever it may be. They lard it over with some religious verbiage to make it seem as though if you oppose this, you oppose the Lord. There are a lot of Americans, I think they're a minority, but they're very vocal, are really aching for an Ayatollah. And what Americans are aching for, certain American presidents are tempted to supply. Certainly in 1987, President George Bush, senior, stated that people who did not believe in God 
might have, at best, questionable rights to American citizenship. I don't know that atheists should be considered as patriots, nor should they be considered as citizens. So, in the United States, no public figure, and certainly no one who wished to enjoy popularity as a politician, could risk it being said that he or she was a disbeliever. And yet, there's a substantial minority in the United States who hold no religious beliefs of any sort at all. It's interesting, as Arthur Miller has just pointed out, that the Christian faith is such a significant theme in American public life today. Because when this country declared its independence in 1776, it also enshrined in law that the church and state should be completely separate. The very first president of the United States, George Washington, for example, was a very unenthusiastic churchgoer who always walked out of the service before the congregation took the sacraments. And when the rector of the church admonished him for this, Washington accepted that his sudden departure might, after all, seem to be a bad example, and so he subsequently never bothered to attend the church at all. And the presidents who closely followed him in that office were often on record as being considerably less than devout Christians. God is an essence we know nothing of. Until this awful blasphemy is got rid of, there will never be any liberal science in the world. The clergy believe that any power confided in me will be exerted in opposition to their schemes. And they believe rightly. I have seldom met an intelligent person whose views were not narrowed and distorted by religion. My earlier views on the unsoundness of the Christian scheme of salvation have become clearer and stronger with advancing years. Judging by the standards set by George Bush Sr., it seems doubtful if any of these great American presidents would have been considered for, let alone voted into office today. All the same, it would be wrong to suggest that the United States is now an uncomfortable place for atheists. I feel entirely at home here, and I'm more often than not in the company of people who have no faith and no time for the officially sanctioned sacred patriotism. For them, as for me, the tenets of and the conflicts between the great faiths, even at their most frightening, are still <laughs> faintly ridiculous. I just feel Jews and Christians, because of they both take origin from the same crackpot sandstorm um, <laughs> experience, um, are shackled together like Tony Curtis and Sidney Poitier in that movie. But not you know. as good looking. <laughs> but not nearly as good looking either of them. You know. I mean, uh, I feel that anti-Semitism, which I deplore, um, uh, is the result of the fact that there are two loony notions, um, Judaism and Christianity. Mm -hmm. you know, that once you get religions hatched in a sandstorm, that holy land, which I always felt whenever I visited, was simply the largest outdoor lunatic asylum in the world. There's a wonderful <laughs> Randy Newman line, and I think it's called The God Song, which goes, there are a bunch of fools in the desert with nothing else to do, so they invented me and they invented you, and it's sung by God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I always feel when I look at Christianity in England, the reason why I feel re relatively indifferent to it is it's lost its power. I mean, it's yes. so desperately yes. keen to solicit support that they're willing to throw God out of the window in order to retain it. And God, for the many of the, the Anglicans, is nothing more than a sort of awkward geriatric relative kept upstairs who might be <laughs> embarrassingly come downstairs incontinently and cause trouble. <laughs> Anglican Church in England is astoundingly moderate and accommodating. All the same, 